Welcome. In this video, we're going to introduce the second of the two main concepts in calculus. We've previously talked about differentiation. In this video, we're going to start building the concept of integration. Just to remind you, the idea of differentiation was to take this idea of the slope of a secant line through two points. So given a function here, we're going to take a point that we're trying to attack. Let's call this A in this case. And we want to find the instantaneous slope at that point um, as it appears on this function. So what we do is we are going to think about a point A plus H, which has through these two points, we can find the secant line. But the thing becomes, well, the closer we make this second point to our first point, the more accurately we can determine the instantaneous slope or instantaneous rate of change. So what we do in this case, we're going to take our two values, f of a and f of a plus h, and we're going to use the difference quotient to find this rate of change. Again, this is the rise over the run, the change in the y values or the outputs over the change of the inputs or the x values. And again, this is this, this average rate of change over this, this interval of length h. But when we introduce the idea of limit to this, specifically the limit as h goes to zero, this goes from talking about this secant or average slope or rate of change and tells us about the instantaneous rate of change and the slope at A. The idea of the integral is significantly different, though you're going to see a beautiful connection between these two very soon, once we've established a rigorous definition and a series of proofs to, for a foundation for this concept. What integration is going to do is it's going to help us find the area under a curve given a certain interval. So if we say from A here to B right here, the question we're going to answer is, what is the area under this curve? And beautifully, this is not just a geometric question, because we wouldn't want to waste our time with that kind of question. What we're going to find, just as we did with this idea of the slope of the tangent line, that became this idea of rate of change, then became, could be used very powerfully in different applications, the same thing is going to happen with integration. So what we're going to do is find the area. We're going to use a, a method similar generally to this method, but what we're going to do is we're going to use this idea of Riemann sums of finding little rectangles to approximate the area, and then start using more and more rectangles. But for instance, the idea of integration is built on this. If I wanted to approximate this area, one thing that I could do was split this, this interval into four parts and create a rectangle. I'm going to use rectangles. We want these to have some kind of similarities in the description. So I'm going to put the top of the rectangle starts here on the left part of these little sub intervals I've created, right? So this is the first rectangle. The second rectangle would start here. The next rectangle would be here. And the final rectangle would be here. And the idea is the area of these rectangles, which is extremely easy to calculate, right? The area of a rectangle is just the length times the width. And then what we do is add up those areas. What you're going to find, and which is the idea over here, when we have two points that are far away, that's not very useful. But we're going to use this idea of a limit to make these infinitely close together. What we're going to build very rigorously for integration is we're going to say, OK, that's fine with four rectangles. But if we made eight intervals, we'd have a better approximation because we wouldn't get these big gaps that jump out of our areas. What if we considered the situation where we have an infinite number of rectangles? All right, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself at that point. I just wanted to give you an idea what we're doing, right? So differentiation is the rate of change. It's the idea of the slope of a tangent line. Integration graphically will represent the area under a curve. Before we get too deep into that, we have to back up. We have to talk about sigma notation that's fundamental to the idea of the integral. Sigma notation is a quick, concise way of just discussing a, a series of terms being added together. In this case right here, I have two sigma statements. In this case right here, I'm going to have a sigma statement that my i or my iteration variable is going to start from 1 and go to 6. This right here is the definition of each term. 
In the second example, you see I'm a little bit different. I'm using k as my iteration variable. It will start at two and it goes to four. And my definition for each term is one over k squared. Um, first, I'll expand these. And I think just seeing the expansions will help you really understand what this notation is saying. All right, so here are the expanded form of these statements. And again, the sigma notation is just describing a series. A series is a, a sequence of values or a sequence of terms that are being added together. In this case right here, this first statement is saying start from one and go to six. And every term is just going to be that, that, in, that index, which is the variable you're iterating with. In this case, it goes from one, then to two, then to three, plus four, plus five, plus six. That this right here is the expansion of what this statement means right here. And then the second example, I'm starting at two and I'm going to four. So I only have three terms here for two, three, and four. And each term is going to be one over that k squared. So I have one over two squared plus one over three squared plus one over four squared. We need this notation because what we're going to do is add these series of, of rectangles, the areas of these rectangles together. In fact, as I alluded to, we're going to have an infinite number of these rectangles. So we have to get pretty dang proficient with working with this sigma notation. In each of these cases, we have these, these sum to certain values, right? This first one is 21. If I add all those values up, if I add these fractions together, I'll get 61 over 144. Real quick, before I move on to some properties of sigma notation, what I want to do is just emphasize these variables right here, the i and the k. It, does, it doesn't need to be any specific variable. This is telling you what's going to be described here, right? It's declaring the variable. We call this, though, the index of the sigma notation. So I'll call it the variable of iteration or the index. All right, now that we have a basic idea of sigma notation, what we need to do is develop a little, some properties of sigmas so that we can actually evaluate very large sums. So my first example is I had a most six terms, but if my n in many cases is 50 or 100, 500, thousands, I wouldn't write out all of those terms. I want moves that I can quickly evaluate those summations. These six right here are amongst a group of those other properties that will allow us to attack these summations, evaluate them for large values of n very quickly. First and foremost, we're looking at the summation that every term is a constant. So seeing this case is some constant value, let's say it's like five, what this is going to do then, it's going to have n terms starting from one to n, but the terms don't change at all. They're all this number five over and over, or in generally just any C constant value. So this is actually the definition of multiplication. It's a repeated addition of the same thing. So that we have n versions of C being added together. This quickly would just be n times C. For number two and three, a, i, and b, i simply represent some term that's described in terms of i and does change. So unlike one where every term is just this constant, a, i means it's going to change as i changes. The important part here is that every term in this sum is also going to have a factor of c. So it's c times something different plus c times something different plus c times something different. But importantly, each term will have a c in it. So we can factor out that c from each of those terms. So what this would become is c times the summation of all of those interesting terms um, described by a, i. So the setup for number three is that you have in each of these terms, you have terms that are describing those. So you have something with an I in it plus something with an I in it. Those don't have to be the same at all, but they're just two different terms in the description of each term. You'll actually see in the next example something that looks a little bit like this. But the game is this, because of the associative and community properties of addition, if we have all of these terms that are described in two different ways in each of our terms, we could separate those two different groups of terms into their own summations. Specifically, if we're doing, we're attacking this summation that has these two terms described differently in terms of i, we can split them up into their own summations, which would look like this. That property is going to be really useful for us when we're trying to take summations that have multiple terms. The game is then you can just attack each of those terms that are in the summation separately. 
All right, for these last three, I'm not going to prove the formulas that I'm giving you, but they're well-known formulas. Um, number one is where each term, this is just like my first example, we start at one, we go plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five, all the way up to n. So the first n whole number starting from one going to n, that will look generally like this, just like that example again that I had, plus all the way to whatever your n is. Um, we can add those up quickly with this formula of n times n plus 1 over 2. In the same way, we can add up all the first perfect squares, starting from 1. So if we square each term, this, this summation would look like 1, plus 2 squared is 4, plus 3 squared is 9, all the way up to n squared. We can evaluate that summation for any n um, by using this formula of n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. And then for number 6, we're just adding the first perfect cubes. In this case, this would be 1 cubed plus 2 cubed plus 3 cubed all the way to n cubed. And the formula for evaluating those for any n starting from 1 to n would be n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4. Okay, then I want to give you an example showing why these are useful. So in this example right here, I'm being asked to evaluate this sum from 1 to 50, where each term is 1 plus i squared. So just to write out a few of these terms so we get a feel for what this is, the first term would be 1 plus 1 squared. The second term would be 1 plus 2 squared, all the way up to the last term, which would be 1 plus 50 squared. And then I think you get the, maybe the idea of why we want these properties and we don't want to have to do all of this work of adding all of these terms together. This has 50 terms and they get pretty dang large, especially towards the end. So what we're going to do is evaluate these with these properties. The first property I'm going to use is number three right here, which lets me look at this and say, aha, each term is in terms itself. I can rewrite this as two separate summations being added together. So I would have the sum from 1 to 50 of just the number 1 plus the sum from 1 to 50 of i squared. Then both of these are properties that I have over here. This is simply that idea of repeated addition of the constant right here, number 1. So this first sum I can just calculate by taking 50 times that constant of 1. In, this, in the second sum, I'm using the i squared summation, where n in this case is 50. So I put 50 into that formula, I'll get 50 times 50 plus 1, which is just 51, times 2 times 50 plus 1, which would be 101, all divided by 6. Then I just plug that into my calculator to figure out that value, and I got 42,000. 975 as the value of that summation. Final thoughts, sigma sum notation actually has more properties than those listed here, but these are the ones that you're going to need in this class. And what we do is use them to evaluate larger sums. And in this case, we just applied a few properties, specifically the number three and then one and five, which gave us the value of this large summation, which I think you can easily agree. It's a heck of a lot easier and quicker to solve it that way than to write all those terms up and add them together.